Broadcasting from the Tazan Lake Lodge Studio. This is Sporting Journal Radio. Presented by OnX. Know where you stand with OnX. Now here's your host, Brett Amundsen. Cheers, everybody, and welcome to another show. I'm Brett Amundsen. Thanks for tuning in on this station or watching this wherever you're watching. And that's Dan Amundsen right over there. Hey, hey. What's happening, Dan? Not a whole lot. All Just, right. Uh, we're doing a radio show, I think. <laughs> kind of radio podcast. We're not quite sure what to call this exactly because it's like a video podcast sure. radio show. Whatever Joe know. Rogan calls it, we'll call it that. Yeah. Plus, we're on 30 radio stations, too. So take that, Joe Rogan. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, we've got a big show for you. In fact, we've got somebody that should be buying Powerball tickets right now. He's probably got a horseshoe you know where because he's from North Dakota and he drew a moose tag and an elk tag this year. They're once-in-a-lifetime tags, and he was successful in both of them. His name is Paul Hoggle, and he'll join us coming up later in the show to tell the story. Uh, and, the, and we'll show you these animals, too. They're, uh, they're nice animals. And the, uh, when you think about moose hunting... And you think about elk hunting, Dan. Oh, Dan, let me ask you this question. When you think about moose hunting, what image do you conjure up in your brain? Ah, uh, Canada, basically. The cold snow, trees, forest, um, maybe a moose charging you out in the middle of nowhere. You see those videos every once in a while. Sure. That's as close to about moose hunting as I've gotten as a YouTube video. So. Right. Um, but not uh, not the prairie. Well, Paul's hunt, yeah, Paul's hunt was nothing like that. Now, think about elk hunting. What do you picture when you... Picture chasing elk. Colorado around. mountains, Montana, <laughs> yeah. horseback. Again, not what not happened North to Paul. Dakota. No, so way cool, way cool story to shoot both of those over there. Uh, so he's going to tell us that coming up later in the show. Also, Lucas Mertens got a. He's back. He's got a Devil's Lake report for us. Devil's Lake. The ice is building up nicely. We'll find out what kind of ice conditions are out there, and if they're catching fish, and uh, when they're going to have those snow bears on the ice as well. And then Joe Henry's going to talk. Uh, snowmobile trails on Lake of the Woods, sturgeon fishing on Lake of the Woods, and we'll find out how they're doing for walleyes right now. Uh, Dan, who's our sponsors this week? Yeah, well, speaking of Haybale Heights, Haybale Heights Campground and Resort on Devil's Lake. Plan a trip to Devil's Lake at haybaleheights.com. Otter Tail Lakes Country, find your inner otter at ottertaillakescountry.com. Lake of the Woods Tourism, plan a trip to Lake of the Woods at lakeofthewoodsmn.com. Tazan Lake Lodge, plan a trip of a lifetime to catch giant lake trout and pike at tazanlake.com. Onyx Hunt, know where you stand with Onyx. Mid-Migration Outfitters, get ready to hunt snow geese this spring in Minnesota or rent one of their guided day fish houses. Learn more at midmigrationoutfitters.com. And Prairie Sportsman, watch episodes anytime at prairiesportsman.org. So we had a pretty wicked storm that rolled through the other night. I think uh, some sort of record about hurricane force winds uh, across the country. Uh, Dan, Lake Superior had some wicked waves going on. Well, they were forecasting like 34-foot waves or something crazy like that. Yeah, that's wild. And you have to wonder how the wildlife survive in weather like that. And obviously it comes down to good habitat. You have to have good habitat. You have to have thermal cover. You have to have windbreaks. You have to have shelter for these animals to uh, get out of the elements, stay warm. And you wonder sometimes how often deer, like it, everyone has their opinions on what deer are doing when there's weather. Oh, it's cold. They're out there moving around. Oh, it's a storm. They're moving around. Oh, it's a storm. They're hunkered down. They're, they're bedded down. They're waiting it out. And it's probably a little bit of both. But I've got some spy point trail camera footage from the other night during that storm. And this is like in the, the, the heart of the storm. This is when the wind was just howling. It was blowing snow sideways. In this video in particular, though, that's a sheltered area right there. And look at how much wind is still blowing through there, blowing that snow sideways. And those two little bucks right there just kind of chilling. I'm sure they're like, when is, hey, did you check the forecast? Did you know it was going to blow this much? Man, I don't have thumbs. I got no phone. What do you mean did I check the forecast? They're just trying to stay warm. They are on their feet, though, moving around, which I was kind of surprised about. And I've got a few other videos of does moving through there, too, and some other deer. But there it is, 150 in the morning, 16 degrees, and probably a good 30-plus mile-an-hour winds whipping through a sheltered area like that. So even, even good habitat. If they were out in the open, obviously, in those elements, it'd be pretty rough for them. But animals are very good at adapting to their surroundings as long as they have places they can they can hide, they can stay warm, they can eat, they can get something to drink. And big game animals always surprise me when I see them in areas that I don't expect them to. But if they have all those things, they can they can thrive there. Like when I moved to North Dakota, Dan, and I saw a moose for the first time, 
And I'm going to tell a few more stories later in the show with with Paul Hoggle when he talks about uh, hunting moose in North Dakota. But uh, a couple of years ago, actually, we were snow goose hunting, and I was with a buddy of mine, and we were driving around uh, scouting snows, and two moose ran across the road in front of us, and one was a cow and one was a small bull. Uh, at least that's what it looked like in this video. You can see just a small little rack on that one one animal right there. But just driving down a gravel road in between some corn and soybeans in eastern North Dakota and just run into a couple of moose running across the road. It's just one of those things you never expect to see. But when it comes to, whoop, I need to borrow this real quick. When it comes to moose and moose hunting in North Dakota, moose are native to North Dakota, but they disappeared following settlement in the late 1800s and early 1900s and did not start reappearing until the 1950s. When moose populations began rebuilding in North Dakota, uh, you know, they flourished in habitats like the Turtle Mountains, uh, you know, Pembina Gorge, the forested areas, river streams and lakes, areas where you'd more think of, see, you know, you'd, you'd consider that more moose habitat than the prairies. But then they started moving out into those, you know, corn and soybean fields and getting out into that flat ag country. And uh, they, they do well. I'm not going to say they have huge, huge numbers, but they do pretty well out there. Again, as long as they have food and cover and water, uh, they'll be fine. Uh, they gave out uh, 470 tags uh, to hunt moose in North Dakota. Now, it's a lifetime license, and it's residents only. So once you draw a license, that's it. You don't get to draw it again, unless you're a landowner. If you can get like a landowner license, if you're unsuccessful, you get the tag back, and then you can, draw, you can apply for it one more time. Non-residents, the only way non-residents can get in on moose hunting in North Dakota is they can participate in the Game Warden Museum Moose License Raffle. You can contact the nearest game warden for raffle tickets. Now, the other big game animal in North Dakota that is uh, pretty neat to see are elk. And they did uh, around 500 tags in North Dakota. And again, it's the same thing. It's a resident-only, lifetime, once-in-a-lifetime type tag that you can get. Um, they did about 500 of them, I guess. And most of them, you'd think of being out in western North Dakota in the Badlands and some of that country out there, but you'd be surprised. There are a few in eastern North Dakota as well, particularly up in that northeastern corner. Now, North Dakota residents are eligible to apply for bighorn sheep, moose, and elk licenses. So that bighorn, uh, that tag is also resident only, although non-residents can apply only for a bighorn sheep license, which I, I was kind of surprised about. I didn't think that was... Uh, I didn't think that was the case, but it is true. And then no one may apply for a species for which he or she has received a lottery license in previous years. So there you go. That's your, your, uh, that's your uh, once in a lifetime. Although non-residents can participate in a Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation elk license raffle, you can contact uh, Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation for more information about those elk tickets. And I got to do some bow hunting for muleys and whitetails in North Dakota one year and had these had two bull elk at about 30 yards including this one right here that dan's about to show us uh so I, I grabbed my camera and took that picture and they stood on the road they were on the road as we were going out to go deer hunting it was me and ben bredigan were out there bow hunting one year and these two bull elk standing on the road man in the sunrise it was a way cool experience for us out there in western north dakota all right. Well, speaking of North Dakota, we're going to stay in North Dakota right now. We're going to go up to Devil's Lake to check in with Lucas Mertens for a Devil's Lake report from Hay Bale Heights Campground and Resort. Ice fishing season is here. This winter, plan a trip to Devil's Lake, North Dakota. Not only will you have the chance to catch their legendary perch, but this year, Hay Bale Heights has been catching big walleye after big walleye. And they're doing it from a mobile, comfortable snow bear. No matter how cold it is outside, you're warm and toasty on the inside. Learn more and book a trip today at haybaleheights.com. That's haybaleheights.com. Well, it's time for the transition of seasons. I know some people have been out there ice fishing already. I haven't yet. I, I'm still chasing pheasants, and I still got to shoot a deer yet. So, uh, But I'm starting to get my stuff ready because it, it won't be long uh, before we'll be out there hitting her pretty hard on the frozen water. And we're going to get a Devil's Lake fishing report right now. Lucas Mertens joins us from Haybell Heights Campground and Resort. Lucas, how you doing? Hey, I'm good, Brett. How are you? I'm, I'm doing all right. I'm starting, to, I'm starting to get into ice mode, and I'm sure you are. You've probably been getting into ice mode for quite a while yet. 
Yeah, probably. Yeah, we've been kind of waiting for ice for about a month now. <laughs> well, it's finally finally coming. Like historically, when do you guys? Because you you mainly just wait until you can put a snow bear out there, right? Yeah, we got some guys out, you know, walking out on the ice. Some of the guides are out testing the ice. Um, typically, we probably don't get our season kicked off real, you know, gung ho until about right after Christmas. Sure. Um, the way the ice is setting up this year, um, we're sitting on five to eleven inches of ice, just kind of depending on where you're at on on Devil's Lake. Um, but we finally got some cold weather. Um, kind of had a storm blow through last night, and I think it's negative one right now. So mm-hmm. we're 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 really making some good ice. So um, I, I was happy to see that the snow kind of went around us you know, until at least we have a good foot base of ice, you know, you don't want to have a lot of snow on there, but no, we should be sitting real good. Um, the early reports, you know, we're finding some perch, uh, the walleyes are hitting. So I'm looking forward to a, to a good year. How did that ice build for you? You know, I, especially with that big, la- that last big storm that rolled through with the, the heavy winds, I don't. It doesn't sound like you guys got hit as hard as uh, some of the people south of you did, and and maybe a little bit further east. But uh, I was a little worried about the wind and and snow um, affecting ice the ice conditions just a little bit. But mm-hmm. I know we only blew open. I think on our lake we actually froze up kind of early. We don't have great ice yet, but we froze up early, and it, it only blew open once this year for us. Where last year I think we blew blew open about three times. Um, okay. Did you guys start building and, and have been making good ice pretty much since you started? Yeah, I'd say we got uh, most of our ice came about two weeks ago. We had a we had a pretty good snowstorm come through the Devil's Lake Basin, and luckily some of the water opened up uh, quite a bit of it. The main bays and the big and the big bodies of water um, opened up, and then we got about a foot of snow, so that just melted right into the lake, which was a good thing so we didn't get that heavy snow on the ice and then right after that storm came through then we 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 locked up again and um, nothing opened up like uh, in last night's storm so with the cold weather coming now and very little snow on the ice i mean we're gonna build ice really fast you know i'm here i'm hearing reports of uh well a couple of our guys that were out you know said they found 11 12 inches which is plenty for a snow bear, um, but there's still some of that five inch stuff. So we just gotta kind of kind of be careful out there. I mean, early ice on any lake, you know, you gotta just kind of tiptoe around and get your bearings and be safe. Yeah, it's not worth it, I don't think. Especially when you're running clients, you want to make sure that you're you're as safe as can be out there. I know I pheasant on it the other day and. Uh, I broke through in the sloughs a couple of times and then we were, uh, you know, a couple of days ago, I would have walked, there, we hunted around a couple of sloughs. I would have walked right across. In fact, I did walk, we did walk across a couple of sloughs pheasant hunting and then we hunted after it warmed up a little bit here for a couple of days. I think we hunted on Wednesday and there was the top of the ice was covered in water and it was probably still safe enough for me to walk across, but I didn't, <laughs> right. I didn't want to. I don't like getting that wet, I guess. Yeah, no, it, that's that's right. I mean, um, I I know of spots where we could take snow bears, but I don't think we're going to take anything out till right after Christmas there just to be on the side with clients. Yeah. Well, the snow bear business has been good for you. I know you keep expanding the fleet. How many bears are you going to be running this year? We should have six on the ice this year. So, yeah, it's been busy. We have a lot of um, just repeat clientele, which is great, and – you know, we're always looking to get some new people out. Um, we got some really nice packages with the lodging, the snow bear uh, guide package. And then, you know, one thing that we do that a lot of places don't do is we'll clean your fish for you. Mm. And that's kind of an added bonus. I know um, a lot of people re- sure appreciate that. They come in from a day of fishing and our guys take care of the fish for them. And, yeah, a lot of people like that. We got a nice fish cleaning shack there. And, uh, of course, those cabins are those cabins are really nice. So, um, is that the way, do you have different packages? Can people stay, um, you know, maybe if if they just drive up for the day or is it all kind of stay and play type stuff or? Uh, well, most of it is, um, you know, the package deal, but we, I will rent, uh, you know, we have cabins 
that, you know, if you just want to come up and fish on your own, if we have some room, you know, you can just rent the cabin on your own and, and go out and tackle Devil's Lake. But I would say like 95% of our client base is the guide package. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Yep. And it, you know, you get out in that snow bear and if it's minus 20 and the wind's <laughs> blowing, it's pretty comfortable in there. You've been on before, you know oh, yeah. all about it. Yeah, for sure. And I want to get up there this, this winter too. Uh, I'd like to get up there and do some fishing. Yeah. It's, it's funny. I mean, when we did it a couple of years ago, Lucas, I think it was 45 or 47 below wind chill or something like that. And yeah, we were sitting there like that in sweatshirts, you know, t-shirts and sweatshirts inside and, uh, staying out of the elements. It was nice. They're comfortable. Yeah. It's, um, it's a nice way to fish. It's kind of a run and gun type of style. You know, if we're not seeing anything on the Vexlars or the live scopes, then, you know, we're going to pick that bear up and we're going to move it and we're going to try to, you know, get on some active fish. And it's easy to move them. So, I mean, it's it's not uncommon to move 10, 15 times a day if you need to. So, Are you running live scopes up there? Yeah, we got some live scopes in mm-hmm. the bears, so that'll be pretty exciting. Um, should have them in most of them this year. It's a pretty big investment, but um, yeah. wait. I don't know. It's kind of it's kind of a game changer. It's kind of like when Vexlars came out, it was a game changer, and this is another game changer. Oh, for sure, man. Uh, especially for a guide service, if you can bounce around and and uh, be able to see that much under the ice like that, that'll be nice. So yeah, you're sure. gonna you're gonna start after Christmas. You got uh, you got some openings right after Christmas for guys. Well, yeah, they can give me a call. We got a pretty full schedule, but we can always try to get. Uh, get someone in i know we got a little bit of time in february left and march you know that's a good time to get up when the weather um warms up a little bit but if anybody's looking to come up um they can call me direct at 701-351-3130 they can go to our facebook page i keep that uh, updated during the winter quite often or they can go to our website haybaleheights.com KBLHeights.com. And, Lewis, when I come up, if you're full, I'll just strap me to the top of the snow bear. I, I'll be all right up there. Well, we'll always find room for you. So <laughs> I got a nice warm suit. I'll be good to go. All right. <laughs> Luke, Lucas Mertens, Hay Bale Heights Campground and Resort. Thanks for the time today on the show. Hey, thanks for having me on. 852 million acres of public land. 147 million private properties. All in the palm of your hand. The number one hunting GPS app just got better. With hundreds of custom map layers, 3D and topographic maps, you can easily scout on the road or at home before you go. And now you can get important weather details, CWD detection, and even know what crops have been planted where. Get the most trusted hunting GPS app ever made. Onyx. Know where you stand with Onyx. Welcome back. I'm Brett Amundsen. Thanks for tuning in on this station right here by downloading the podcast wherever you get your favorite podcasts or by watching this video, YouTube, Facebook, etc. Dan Amundsen is right over there. Hey, Dan. Hey, hey. All right, coming up, we got a Lake of the Woods fishing report here with Joe Henry. Plus, what did Corey Loeffler do now? We'll show you the picture here in just a second. But first, I'm going to talk about Stamp It Forward. This is from Sam Solholt and Public Land Tees. You've probably heard us talk about it quite a bit. Maybe you've seen it on social media. Well, Boss did another limited edition run of the two and three quarter inch number five shorties with the paper holes, the old school paper holes. And uh, they have the Stamp It Forward logo on there. And they donated 50 bucks of every case to uh, the federal duck stamp program or the stamp it forward program, which buys federal duck stamps. And I think it's what 98% of every dollar spent on uh, the federal duck stamp goes into habitat creation. It's hands down the best government program. When you look at government programs in our country and how much money is wasted, here's a great program where literally almost every cent that goes into that program goes back out to what the program is meant to do, and that's create habitat for ducks, which also benefits habitat for uh, white-tailed deer, uh, all kinds of songbirds and other critters, and of course pheasants, which I spend plenty of time chasing, including taking out the new boss, pay it, uh, stamp it forward, shotgun shells after roosters, just like this one right here. So oh, I shot that one going away, shot him kind of in the back, you can see where I hit him. Sometimes that's uh, kind of a tough shot because there's some armor back here, it's kind of hard to get into those vitals, but uh, that old boss to stamp it forwards, two and three quarter fives. 
knock that bird down with no problem. Nice job on the camera work there, Dan, as well, too. That was something with my buddy Jason Markla with Bang Brewing. And uh, you can see, you know, sometimes when you hit those pheasants going away, it's not necessarily a hard shot, but you don't always get a good, clean kill on them. And a lot of times you'll wound them or break a wing or something like that, and then your dog's got to chase them a little bit. But that, that pheasant went nowhere after I pulled the trigger on it. And uh, Mika brought it back, which is uh, always nice to see the old lady getting on some birds once again. And of course, I got introduced to boss from Corey Loeffler from the DRC Call Company, who's off on another venture. That guy, Dan, that guy has been gone way more than he's been home this this fall. Last year, I was telling Corey this uh, the other day, last year, I hunted up with him, I don't know, three, four times last fall in different places, and then went on a two-week trip with him down to Texas and back. And I talked to him before this fall. I was like, Corey, we should, you know, what do you want? Let's, let's plan a trip this fall. He goes, dude, my fall is, I'm not, my wife is going to divorce me by the end of fall because uh, he's gone. He was gone all the time and she's not, she's great. But uh, he's on another trip right now. And <laughs> I sent him a message. I said, how's, how's the trip going? He goes, ah, pretty good. I built a fire in the blind. Shenanigans. <laughs> That's all the message said. And I said, you built a fire in the blind. So that picture right there, that is uh, from the Quack Rack Instagram story um, slides. Anyway, so they built a blind in a sandbar along a river, and it was cold. I think it was below zero. And uh, so Corey hollowed out a hole in the sandbar, built a fire, and then, I don't know, built a chimney on it, built a hole, a warming, uh, I don't know if that's... He built a fire pit in the middle of a sandbar, something only Corey Loeffler would probably do. So there's your shenanigans. And I think they shot some birds. So Corey's always got something, always got something entertaining up his sleeve and you go on a trip with him. All right. Coming up later in the show, we're going to talk to Paul Hoggle. He uh, shot himself a moose and an elk this year in North Dakota. But right now we're going to go up to Lake of the Woods to check in with Joe Henry from a Lake of the Woods fishing for a Lake of the Woods fishing report. The ice fishing season is here, ladies and gentlemen. We're going to talk about ice fishing up at the Walleye Capital Lake of the Woods right now with Joe Henry from Lake of the Woods Tourism. Joe, how's it going? Hello. I'm doing good, Brett. How are you? So if people are wanting to plan a trip up to Lake of the Woods, one of the best places you can start with, and we're going to get, we're going to get an ice report and a fishing report here, but uh, the, the start of planning a trip to Lake of the Woods starts on your website, right? Because you can find all these different resorts there in one place and uh, find out where you might, might be able to stay. Well, I'll tell you something. So we have resorts, hotels, sleeper fish house businesses, Airbnbs, VRBOs. We have everything on the Lake of the Woods MN.com website. In addition, we have a lot of really helpful information, including videos and such about, about ice fishing, about you uh, working the one, two punch, how to get walleyes to eat, uh, what, what kind of lures to use in stained water. I mean, really we have everything. And I'll tell you the other thing is this is the time of year where things can get pretty busy, especially on weekends. It's the holidays and everybody has off. So, you know, if you want to make that last second trip up to Lake of the Woods, there's still hope. And one of the tools we have is called the Lodging Availability Finder. Basically, you put in your contact information. You put in um, what part of the lake you want to stay at. Do you want to stay up at the Northwest Angle or do you want to stay in the South End slash, you know, Rainy River? And then you simply uh, um, put in special requests in there. Hey, I'd like, a, you know, lodging for four nights and uh, fish house for three days or whatever. And then you hit submit. And that email is sent to all the different lodging facilities within the geographic area you selected. So rather than dialing for dollars, you can send that out in one blast. And in many cases, when they have openings and such, they can email you back. I got to tell you, well before I was tourism director, I'd, uh, I'd get an opportunity to run up to Lake of the Woods on a weekend, maybe spur of the moment. I'd just jump on my car and freaking go. And I'd have a list of phone numbers that I'd be dialing on the way up, trying to find a place to stay. And it was really interesting because that – that process, they didn't have this kind of tool back then, but that process is really what got me staying at some of the 
behind the scenes resort, some of the real small nook and cranny places that I actually kind of knew before I even became tourism director. And I want to make good friends with them. I stayed there over and over, but I never would have even known of their names because maybe they don't have the big marketing engine that some of these smaller places, you know, uh, um, do, or some of the bigger places do, I should say. So what I want to do, Joe, is I want to stay at the South end and then take a snowmobile up to the Northwest angle. Well, you know, you're in luck because uh, Friday, uh, Friday, December 17th is when that trail opens up. I, uh, I had the, I had the pro- pleasure of speaking to Greg Hennem. Greg Hennem's the owner of uh, Sportsman's Lodge. He also ha- has started that uh, Lake of the Woods passenger service, which is that bombardier and or charter boat service that takes people from the south end up to the northwest angle. He, he grooms the snowmobile trail going up to the angle. So him and Mike Markor, one of his guides, uh, they typically are together in that deal. Now imagine, before that process even starts, Brett, they're, uh, they're looking at satellite images of the lake, trying to get a, an idea of how the ice is forming um, up that route. And then, of course, they actually fly the lake in an airplane, getting a, a much closer look at everything. And then when they actually go up there, he was telling me what he does is they go up on snowmobiles, and he actually stands up and goes at a moderate place. But he stands and really watches that ice because he can tell just from years of experience. I mean, he grew up on the lake. But he can tell by watch, looking at that ice when things are a little bit kittywampus and when, and when maybe ice conditions change. He can tell by different colors. You can tell by there's a bunch of charred ice with you know ridges sticking up, and all of a sudden there's a real smooth part. Well, chances are that smooth part was open water and it froze late. Um, you can tell where water's been, uh, you know, before it froze up, there might have been ice with open water, and it was real windy. So that water, the waves were lapping up on that under the ice, and you can see where it froze that way. I mean, you could tell a lot of things he said just by looking at the ice. So anyway, they go up there and they mark it and they check all the the areas that don't have real thick ice. And then what they do is they keep watching those thin ice areas until they get to the point where they're they're acceptable, and and then the trail staked. So that's going to happen uh, again tomorrow morning. Um, and I should say too, you know, you, you've driven on that trail. It's kind of neat how they do it. They have these big black stakes that show up so good against the ice and snow. And then on top of those stakes are real bright reflectors that uh, if you're going at night, uh, you can see them real well. Are they getting walleyes up there right now, Joe? Yeah, they're getting walleyes up there. Um, They're just, you know, they all start a little bit later up at the Northwest Angle. Um, But yeah, their their houses are staged. Some of the guides are pre-fishing. And uh, uh, I talked to one guy, I don't want to make you jealous, but um, he says, yeah, you know, we got our houses in one spot. It's more of a morning evening bite. And I said, well, uh, enough to get your limit. <laughs> First half hour of the day, you'll have your limit. It's just a matter of if you want to go home and take a nap in the afternoon or just stay out there and try to catch a few. <laughs> so that, that was kind of fun. And then, um, um, yeah, and then, you know, in the south end of the lake, it's been a bonsai. I mean, it's been really, really good. And, you know, um, the, the overall fishing report, it changes every day and it changes with different places you fish. But overall, um, anglers are rifling through a lot of numbers of fish, walleyes and saugers. They're getting their fish to keep. And they're also getting some some nice trophies like like you see there, um, yeah. It's been uh, it's been real real good. And you know the trophies, but realistically, you're going to get one once in a while if you're fishing up at Lake of the Woods. But uh, you're going to get numbers, and within those numbers, you'll get your keepers typically. Boy, it's been really good fishing as of late. What about chasing something other than walleyes up there? Maybe pike or sturgeon. Yeah, you know, uh, I'll tell you, uh, there there have been some. Uh, anglers that are pike nuts out tip up fishing and normally they have those areas all to themselves but they have just been small oak and the big pike uh if, if you're watching this on video you can see the size of this big pike coming out of the water and this thing is just a freaking tank and the coolest thing about it is it's probably a 44 inch i think and the coolest thing about it it's got a a digested eel pout probably a two pound <laughs> eel pout yeah. coming out of its belly out of its mouth it uh, it kind of basically upchucked it when it was probably fighting but it is just the coolest darn video ever if you like pike fishing they've been smacking pike people are catching you know going after them and then of course sturgeon fishing most of that happens on the river in fact one of our resorts rainy uh, sorry um royal dutchman resort which is just east of the on the rainy river they're out checking ice conditions and they actually have fish houses out for sturgeon and their sturgeon houses have bigger fish holes. They're set up uh, so you're playing the current. You know, when you're when you're ice fishing in, in, in current, um, you're, you're, you set your house up so that all the lines are going downstream. You don't want the lines crossing each other. So they got all that dialed in. They got they know where the safe areas are, and uh, they're doing a really nice job of getting people on sturgeon, which, you know, really most of our resorts don't do. Most of our resorts are dialed in on walleyes and saugers on the lake. These guys are 
They get walleyes and saugers on the river too, but they're getting dialed in on sturgeon, which, boy, for something different. And they've been getting them. In fact, one of the uh, one of the videos they have up, somebody got a 66 incher. Uh, they got oh, one uh, just under through 60, the ice. I think. Oof. Through the ice. And boy, yeah. when you when you watch that video, you can tell these guys are armed for sturgeon. They're using uh, uh, pretty good size open face reels with a heavier, beefier ice rod. And then when they're fighting this thing. I mean, they're hanging on to that little rod with all they have, and uh, that thing is just ripping line. And then finally, when they get it up, I think somebody grabbed. I think in one case they probably grabbed it under the under the gills and mouth and put them up in the ice. But I think in one other case they tailed it. You know, they grabbed that. The, the, the tail on a sturgeon's hard, so yeah. you can actually grab that tail and pull them out of the water. And, um, really, some uh, some neat stuff. I've caught sturgeon through the ice before on Lake of the Woods. Um, it was accidental fishing for walleyes. You know what? Uh, one time, I uh, it was just right at that prime time, you know, that the golden hour at night, just sun was going down. I had a big mark coming on my uh, my Vexlar, and I jigged it, and boom, it hit. I set that hook, and I'm not kidding, my rod broke. So I, I, I had him my real office, give me a line, give me a line, and uh, and I fought this thing, and you know, I didn't know it was a sturgeon probably for the first five minutes. I was hoping it was a big walleye, then I thought big pike, and then I'm like, okay, I think I know what this probably is took me an hour and a half to get it in and oh uh, it was dark out by the time I got it up and, and we got it. And, uh, so it was kind of fun, but I've gotten a couple of sturgeon through the ice and you know, it takes a little time, but it is fun. You better pull up all your lines when you get a sturgeon. Let me yeah. just tell you. Well, I'm, I'm all about catching walleyes and I love catching big walleyes too. Um, and especially if you're going to Lake of the woods, you're going to want to target walleyes a little bit, I'm sure. But being able to fight something that big, you know, uh, I mean, just the chance to fight, you know, and something that might take you an hour and a half. I mean, that's that's not something you can just do anywhere. And that's not the, the type of experience you're going to get, you know, every day. So having the opportunity to catch a dinosaur like that would be pretty fun. You know, it's it's arguably the biggest fish you'll catch in freshwater. You yeah. know, and uh, I'll tell you what, you know, you, you've caught sturgeon. I know you have. And, you know, when you, when you take a, a heavy rod and reel with heavy line and you put the freaking beef to them and you put pulling that thing off the bottom and it – won't budge yeah. you know you're in for a fight those i tell you those sturgeon they're not lackadaisical they freaking fight if i in open water they jump out of the water and things like that obvious ice fishing they run like crazy they'll rip that line off your reel like you un, like there's no tomorrow for sure yeah. well joe yeah there, there we are I was, I was filming a tv <laughs> show with greg jones in this one i couldn't get that darn sturgeon in the boat that's a third <laughs> try and i'm like greg i need help i'm not letting him go and he came and double teamed them and we got him in. But I'll tell you, you know, it's like pulling in a dead body. Not that I know what that's like, but, you know, I tell you what. It's, <laughs> I hope not. They're, they're, they're not that easy to get in because they're big fish, you know. Jeez. Yeah. Well, people want to get up there and uh, chase a big giant sturgeon or some big giant walleyes or some big giant pike uh, or do some snowmobiling and all the trails that you got up there. What should they do, Joe? Hey, check out our website. That is lakeofthewoodsmn.com. Looking for winter adventure? Might as well pick a place with over 1,000 lakes. Ottertail County, Minnesota is in the middle of everywhere, offers a simpler pace, and has something for everyone. Find your inner otter at ottertaillakescountry.com. All right, we got a really cool story for you right now. Thanks for tuning in on the network, By Demand, Sporting Journal Radio, or by watching this uh, wherever you're watching this. Thank you very much. This, this is one of those stories. It's one of those really cool hunting stories. You, you don't really hear about something like this happening very often. It's one of those things that you wish would happen to you, but it's really cool when you get a chance to talk to somebody that it happened to in North Dakota. And I, I'm going to tell a couple of North Dakota moose stories here during this interview. But when I found out that there was moose in North Dakota, uh, you know, I was kind of blown away by it. Growing up in Minnesota and going to the Boundary Waters, going up the Gunflint Trail, when I think of moose, I think of, you know, either northeastern Minnesota in the, in the, the woods and the Canadian Shield country or up in the Canadian wilderness, right? You don't think about a moose walking through a bean field, you know, in the, in the, in the central prairies. Uh, but that's what you have in North Dakota. I mean, obviously, you've got a few parts of North Dakota that have some trees and some hills. But for the most part... It's wild seeing a moose just out in the middle of the prairie, but they're there. And not only that, but North Dakota's got, you know, North Dakota gets a bad rap sometimes uh, being kind of flat and windy and f full of corn and beans. But if you go to different parts of North Dakota, it's, it's really uh, quite beautiful. The Badlands are amazing and Badlands are full of elk. 
So how about somebody that essentially drew lifetime tags, once in a lifetime tags for moose and elk and was successful both in the same year. And that's what our next guest did this, did this year. Paul Hoggle joins us right now. Paul, how you doing? Oh, good. Good. Glad to be on. I bet you are doing well. I mean, can you, could do, would you ever imagine that you'd shoot a moose and an elk in North Dakota in the same year? I uh, never dreamt it was going to happen. I've, yeah, I, I never thought it would happen, I guess. Yep. It's awesome. And they were both big animals, too. Both nice trophy animals. Um, let, let's just back up for one second and talk about the odds of drawing one of these tags. So uh, I, have you been in North Dakota your whole life? I have, yep. All right. And um, you're in Fargo now, but you don't live in Fargo, right? Uh, yeah, I live in Carrington. Carrington. Very cool. How many years have you been applying for these tags? No, oh, basically since I was uh, 16, 18, somewhere in there, years old. So, and you're... And, and I'm, oh, and I'm 45. Okay. So uh, 30, 30 years, whatever. Yeah, yeah, that's crazy. So that's, I mean, and and the uh, the moose tag was a landowner tag, right? Correct. And Correct. Th- those are a little bit easier to come by? They are. I When I looked at the odds, I think it was about... As of last year or the year before, I think it was about a 15% chance of drawing where I live um, with the landowner. Otherwise, I, it was less than 1% on the moose. And I think uh, elk, I drew that up in the northeast corner of the state, but that was a 0.4% chance of drawing that tag. 0.4%. And had you not been successful with uh, the moose landowner tag this year you'd be able to draw for it one more time one more time i would uh i'd have to return send my tag back into the state and then after that i can apply again or keep applying until hopefully you draw again and then that and if i draw it again that's the the last time so there's you get to draw moose in north dakota is kind of interesting um there's not a, a lot of them there's a healthy population of them um, but they haven't been, it's, it, we don't need to get into this story, but they haven't been as affected as the, the moose in Northern Minnesota. And I always thought that was interesting because as the moose in Northern Minnesota, the population declined, everybody tried to point fingers at wolves or brain worm or, uh, climate change or whatever the case may be. Yet it's the same species of moose in North Dakota and their population hasn't declined and I've always said, well, what's the difference between Minnesota and North Dakota? And there's one glaring difference, and it's a, it's a giant predator with, you know, four legs and sharp teeth. But I, I remember, Paul, I lived in North Dakota, and I did, uh, I did radio in Fargo for about 12 years. And, I, you know, I hunted all across North Dakota. And I remember snow goose hunting one time, and I was driving around with a buddy of mine. And uh, we were kind of scanning the horizon for flocks of snow geese or snow goose feeds, whatever. And I see, oh, there's a, just a, that's weird. This is the random cow stand, standing out in the middle of a cut cornfield. It's kind of a weird, weird place for a cow to be standing. It must have got, gotten out of, out of a fence or something. And as we got closer, no, I realized it was a moose. And that was the first time I'd seen a moose in North Dakota. And it just, it just seemed so out of place for me to see a moose in the middle of a cornfield you know, instead of, you know, in, in the middle of a boreal Swamper. forest. Yeah. <laughs> yep. You know, so and then I driving back one time, I, I was uh, I was coming into West Fargo on 94 and I looked on the south side of the, the interstate there and there was a car pulled over. There was a frontage road and there's just a car, a random car parked next to a bean field. I'm like, that's a and it wasn't a farmer's truck, you know, so it was like a weird vehicle to be parked and just stopped on a along the uh, the interstate. And sure enough, there was a there was a moose walking through the bean field and they were stopping to take pictures or take a look at it or whatever. And it just it just like my my head exploded seeing these moose in North Dakota like that after growing up in Minnesota. But uh, it's a pretty cool deal. So how I mean, obviously, around Carrington, you you, you'll see moose around there occasionally. I've seen moose around Carrington before. Have have you seen a lot of moose growing up? Not up until probably. Oh, shoot, I'd say five years ago did I start seeing them around, right around Carrington. You'd always see a random one here or there. And and it's not like we have a huge number, but there's um, there's moose traveling through our area all the time. I think last year um, I saw five bulls in one slough. 
Oh, Not wow. that they lived there, but they just wandered through. And, and I mean, none of them were real big, but, but it was five bulls, bull moose in there. And so, yeah, we're getting some moose traveling through our area. And some, I think, are actually becoming slightly resident that kind of come back. So, Dan, pull up a picture of this moose that he shot this year. This is, this is a big animal. What Did you know that this moose was around? I, I had seen him last year, and if uh, you see under his front forks or whatever you want to call them, those two tines on each side. Yeah. Kind of like drop tines, because that's unique. Most moose don't have that, or I've never seen it, I guess. Sure. Where they come out from underneath. And I, I had seen that bull. He was obviously smaller last year. But he was right uh, on my stuff and right next to my stuff. And then I think he kind of migrated away a little bit this year, probably five, six miles. And and I still had uh, a cow and a calf on mine and a small bull. And um, he ended up wandering back back to to my ground. So you'd seen this. You saw this, this moose last year. Yes, correct. Yep, and he came back. Cause, and the reason I very confident is because how many moose have them tines underneath like that we call them drop tines i don't know if that's the technical term for them or not but that's uh he's pretty distinct that way character wise that's cool i love i mean everybody wants to shoot big big racked animals but i love unique you know racks something that sets them apart a little bit something different like that uh that's pretty cool did you measure him like how how big was he actually we we scored them at uh, gross. Uh, what, gosh, one fifty nine, some one sixty, basically. Hmm. That's that's so cool. Uh, I think moose are just neat animals anyway, and to be able to shoot one in North Dakota like that on, on your own property. I know we talked off the air, and you said it. You know, it's not this big adventure hunting story, but to be able to shoot them on your own property. So, did you have them on trail cameras or anything? Not him. Not this year. Uh, I had them last year, but not this year. Um, some other, them other moose I talked about, they were, they were coming in and hitting my, my bait station for deer. And yeah, they, yeah, he, I had a few pictures of the other moose, not that one specifically this year. Sure. And then you, so one day did you, you saw him on your property then and said, Oh gosh, he's back. Yeah. Yep. I knew there was that cow white just seemed a little was acting a little different so she must have been coming into heat or whatever and and i was just like well something bigger is going to show up you know because it sounds from what research i've or from what i've heard and whatnot they'll travel 10 miles in a night to find a hot cow sure and and i that i'm pretty pretty confident that was the situation on this one and then uh so you got them you got them butchered up what did you do steaks burger what'd you do with them i did yep steaks roast burger um and that is one thing i'm i'll say i'm a little picky on like deer meat i i love deer meat deer sausage deer jerky all that but i'm not a real wild game guy um just to eat a a roast out of a deer say um i will but it's not my favorite that moose is so close to beef it's amazing I was truly amazed at how good that is. Yeah, it is. Moose is delicious. And if, if you're, you're obviously a deer hunter and dragging a deer out is, is, uh, can, can be pretty easy, obviously. What, what did you have to do with the moose? You could probably drive right up to it, I suppose, if it was in one of your fields. Yeah, it was in my cornfield. And, yeah, it was, wasn't too hard. Just brought the skid steer out and picked it up and put it on a trailer. <laughs> so that's why I say this hunt wasn't super exciting and had to quarter them up and pack them out 10 miles or anything but but oh. still exciting in its own right oh absolutely man and it's a moose and all that see i get i get so excited about the meat now i do i, I eat a lot of deer i like to eat it um so wild game we eat it every day here and uh i would i obviously a, a big moose would be pretty special and i'd probably put it up on the wall for sure but i'd be i'd be so excited about that meat do you know about how much meat you got out of it so I, I had them, I took it into the locker plant in town and they, uh, it was 472 pounds of straight meat. I got back. And that wasn't <laughs> blended with anything. That was just straight oh, moose man. meat. That's awesome. 
All right. I'll be over for uh, moose burgers later. Absolutely. <laughs> All right. Um, Paul, congratulations on the moose. I want to talk about the elk. Uh, if you're listening to us on the radio, we're going to take a quick break. We'll come back and talk elk uh, here with Paul Hoggle, who shot a moose and an elk in North Dakota this year. But uh, we can keep you on a break or don't matter. Or should we just keep rolling? Just keep rolling. All right. So now we want to talk about your elk. How many years have you been applying for an elk license? Same same deal. Same scenario. Yep. I have always wanted to try to shoot a North Dakota elk, but uh, the well, and now that I live in Minnesota, I can't. Um, well, what is it? One of them, non-residents can only apply for a, a sheep tag, I, I think, and there's only a couple of sheep tags, which I, I didn't even think non-residents could apply for a sheep tag, but I was looking at some of the regs here on the ND Game and Fish website, and I haven't lived over in North Dakota now for about 10 years, so things may have changed, but there's... Uh, there is a, a game warden raffle tag. Do you know anything about that, Paul? That you can get for? I can't remember if it's for elk or moose. I can't remember. Oh, I'm not sure. I think they raffle a, a bighorn. I don't know about elk and moose. I guess. Well, I'd have to look into it. But essentially, you got to be a resident for these lifetime uh, tags, which I'm totally cool with, uh, just because the opportunity is so limited and and just uh, quite the opportunity. So, uh, obviously, you. Uh, you see elk occasionally here on the eastern side of North Dakota, but primarily you got to go out west for them. I'm assuming you went out west for this hunt. Uh, no, I was actually in the northeast corner. Oh, you were. Uh, of Interesting. The state. Yep. Ah, that's that's even better. Uh, so is that is that up? I'm up by Pembina, maybe. Is that? Yep. Yep. The Pembina Gorge through that area. Now, yep. are those some of those same elk that go into Minnesota? Like that? Uh, what's that herd yep. that's up there in the northeast corner? The Kitson herd, maybe. Greg I guess I haven't heard that name. I'm not sure, but I, they got to be the same in the southern uh, Canada one, southern Manitoba. It's all. I would assume it's all the same herd. Yeah, because because Minnesota's got they got the Gregla animals, and then it's like I can't. I, I haven't looked into it for a while, and I can't remember. But there's like three of them, and they're all kind of small. Except the biggest one comes in from Manitoba and comes down, and they kind of go back and forth across the border, which has got to be right up there by. Uh, um, well, it's by, they're by, I think they're by Halleck. So it's gotta be just across the border from Pembina there. But, um, that, so had, did you know that there was elk up there or what made you go up that direction? Is that where you drew a tag for that zone? Yeah, that's where I drew the tag and that's where I've been applying. Um, I've heard there's decent elk up there. Uh, you know, and access, there's a fair amount of state land up there. So, and I heard there's decent numbers now. So that's, that's why I applied up there. All right. And how much scouting went into that hunt? Uh, not a lot before. So up there, um, take a step back, like Western North Dakota, you can use a rifle starting September 3rd. I think it opened this year. Up there, you have to use a bow for the month of September. Okay. And um, so I was up uh, twice before season. And then just trying to get the lay of the land. And I didn't have much private land to go on. So I was going to be hunting a lot of state ground. And uh, so I just wanted to get a feel for it. Never really put eyes on an elk while I was up there. Hmm. Just it was more figuring out roads, how to access some of the stuff and that sort of thing. And then started hunting in September with a bow up there. Did you shoot it with a bow? Nope. I shot it with a rifle. I ended up taking it with the rifle last week. Okay. Oh, yeah. you just shot it. All right. Yep. Look at that. And but I, well, I hunted. Uh, I hunted twenty six days for oh. this elk. Wow. Yeah, that's putting some so time in. I put some time in a couple hours from home, and yeah, yep. But yeah, I, I paid my dues somewhat on this one. Uh, yeah, it, it was awesome shooting that elk. You know, last week with the rifle, but the funnest part of the hunt was probably with the bow during the rut that is an experience i will never forget were they chasing cows around and bugling fighting just bugling and getting them in close you know i probably i hunted almost all state land and uh i i bet i was within 60 70 yards of 12 bulls 15 bulls throughout Many, you know, several trips, probably 16, 17 days up there at that point in the month of September. But, and they're just ripping off, bugling and all raking trees. And yeah, it was, it was intense. 
That's awesome. So, so tell me when you first laid eyes on this elk that you shot. So we were, uh, well, we were sitting just waiting for him to come out to feed basically. And I had a buddy with me and we were just waiting. We knew there was elk in that area waiting for him to come out. Cause now with the snow and crunchiness, it, at this time of year, they got to feed the ruts over. You don't really know. You just start looking for tracks and hoping they come out to feed. So we knew there was tracks and there was elk around there. And, and, uh, I had sat out there earlier that morning and I'd passed on a, he was a six by six, but he's broke off. So I held out. So all day I'm, <laughs> I'm 26 days into this hunt and I'm like, man, did I screw up? I probably should have shot that one. <laughs> Cause it was a 300 class bull. And I, yeah, I didn't shoot. So anyways, my buddy came out and sat then the afternoon with me and uh yeah this uh, cow started filtering out and that bull i passed in the morning came out and then i think we ended up with 40 elk in front of us there Jeez. by about five o'clock and then the the one i got ended up coming out and he he must have been there i think he was just sitting back in the trees watching the herd come out first and then once they were all feeding and grazing, then he decided to come trotting across into the open. He was and he was letting them make sure it was safe for him. That's what it was. That's what I think, too. Yep, exactly. And he came running across and gave me a broadside shot and and put him down. Oh, that's awesome. So how did you have to, uh, you know, quarter him to get him out or how'd you pack him out or how'd that process go? No, this, uh, I was lucky enough to get on, uh, a cattle guy's land up there oh, and it was perfect. pretty flat land where we were. So I wasn't in deep coolies. This was more flat land stuff. And, uh, we were able to drive up to it and, uh, we drug him out and then, then we got it. Um, and then, uh, the rancher, he brought his, his front end loader and loaded him up for me. <laughs> okay. so. I hope you're buying Powerball tickets by the, you know, by the handful right now, because not only did you shoot a North Dakota elk and moose in the same year, but you were able to drive to each of them, <laughs> load them up, drive them out. I don't know, heard the old saying about a horseshoe, go right. horseshoe. Yeah, yeah, my buddies are they're like, we're just going to follow you around until you lose it. So. Man, that's incredible. I, uh, I was hunting out in the Badlands one year. I was bow hunting out there and, uh, me and a buddy were just, we were we were up next to some public land, but we had like 400 acres of private land that we were going to hunt, and we were just jacked about it. We had gone out there and scouted and put up trail cameras, and then we came back out for the hunting season. And I think we were on our way out there. We were driving out there in '94, and my buddy calls me up that lives out there that got us on the on the property. He goes, "Yeah, so uh, we just drew once in a lifetime." elk tags for that property and there's four big bulls on it so <laughs> you guys can oh, come geez. stay out here but uh, you're gonna have to find somewhere else to hunt so we uh <laughs> we were able to stay we were staying on the property and one morning we we were driving out to leave and uh as we got to the end of the driveway there were two bull elk standing standing right on the driveway which dan i don't know if you can find it but i got a picture of these two elk standing on the driveway in the sunrise and we we're like 30 yards away from them it was oh, wow. uh, it was a pretty wild experience. That's the closest to uh, to to wild elk that I guess I've been. Um, haven't tried hunting them yet, but yeah, they're an amazing animal without a doubt. So That's... what what did that one score at then? Uh, we we got him roughed at uh, gross three eighty four. Ah oh, man, I think some people would be shocked to realize just not only do we have elk in. North Dakota slash Minnesota, but some big elk as well. Yes. Yep. Absolutely. There is an out West. Uh, well, wherever they have units, there is a chance at a trophy of a lifetime, a world-class animal. How much meat did you get off of him? I uh, didn't get that weighed. Um, mm. So I'm not sure, but it, yeah, my freezers are full. <laughs> <laughs> freezers. Yeah. Freezers. <laughs> yeah. Gosh, that's awesome. so much meat off of both of those big animals and the, the fact that you got them both. So, I mean, do you just hang it up at this point and retire? I mean, what? how do you top this? I, as far as elk, I'm like, I, I think you could shoot a bigger moose 
you know, if you go to the Yukon or something or whatever. But uh, as far as the elk, I don't. That's a tough one to beat. I, yeah, I don't. I don't know if I'll go elk hunting anymore. <laughs> I'll focus on mule deer and whitetails again. So, have you ever go? Uh, have you ever gone out west in you know, a Montana, uh, Colorado, or anything for elk? Uh, Montana, I shot a bull back in mm. 2009 uh, in the Missouri River breaks up there. Nice. Okay. And that's the only time I've ever elk hunted prior to this year. Guys, shoot some both and can drive. I still can't believe you, you drew tags same year in North Dakota, shot them both, and drove right up to both of them. That's just a great story. Yeah, it's, it's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> Well, uh, that's awesome. All right. Well, what about any other animals uh, other than than deer on the horizon for you? Any trips planned or anything? Uh, no. My next focus is a mule deer. Um, yeah, I've I, I've never shot a North Dakota mule deer. Hmm. Yep, I've shot them in eastern Montana, but never uh, never North Dakota. I got lucky one time. Uh, in fact, it was 10 years ago this week. It came up on my Facebook memories. I shot a muley with my bow out in the Badlands. And I was uh, hunting with a buddy of mine, and we we didn't get to drive up to the deer though, Paul. We had we had to haul okay. it out, and uh, we had to haul it across the Little Missouri River. And my buddy had a uh, an old golf cart, you know, like the the um, the manual ones that you just pull by hand that you'd strap your golf bag into. He had converted oh, yep. that into a big game carrier, so I got a picture. Yeah, well, there's the picture right there, Dan. Yeah, I got a picture of us standing on the Little Missouri River with my muley in a in a golf cart. Oh, neat. <laughs> and that, yeah, ten years ago this week. There it is. Oh, All right, nice. Well, uh, congratulations again on the success. Um, just an unbelievable story, uh, Paul Hoggle. Thanks for the time today on the show. All right, thank you, Brad. Sporting Journal Radio is a division of Macaba LLC. If you've got a question, comment, or story idea for us, send us an email. Go to SportingJournalRadio.com. While you're there, you can learn how to advertise on the show and visit our store for hats, hoodies, coffee mugs, and more. Go to SportingJournalRadio.com.